What's up everybody? In this video we'll be differentiating the high yield common testicular pathology that shows up on USMLE and Comlex. This is brought to you by Dirty Medicine. The terms that we're going to be differentiating are testicular torsion, epididymitis, hydrocele, varicocele, and testicular tumor. Now when you go to take your USMLE or Comlex, oftentimes what happens, or even on shelf exams or in-class exams, is the question will be about differentiating between certain subgroups. So I'm gonna color code them for you now. Usually the test question will ask you to pick between testicular torsion and epididymitis because they're so similar. And likewise, other challenging questions could ask you to pick between hydrocele and varicocele because they're also pretty similar. Now, obviously any question that you get that involves testicular pathology chances are your five answer choices are gonna be what you see on this slide. But what I'm saying is that in the question vignette, the part that you have to look for certain buzzwords to be able to differentiate between what you see in blue and what you see in red is really nitty gritty. So the focus of today's video is not only on understanding all of this different testicular pathology, but more so understanding how we differentiate between what you see in blue and what you see in red. And then testicular tumor is kind of its own unique little thing, and that's why it's in green. So let's start with talking about the differences between testicular torsion and epididymitis. The reason that this is really confusing is because in a test question, the presentation is going to be the same, regardless of what type of pathology you're dealing with here between these two. You're going to have a unilateral painful testicle. And the way that you're going to figure out is this torsion or is this epididymitis is you're going to ask yourself, what's happening with the Pren sign and what's happening with the cremaster reflex. Now to be clear, the most important thing here is probably going to be the Pren sign. Let me just take a moment to explain what these things are. So for the Pren sign, elevation of the scrotum, so literally putting your hand around the scrotum and lifting the affected testicle up, that if that improves the pain, that's a positive Pren sign. All right, so that's Pren sign. Pren is when you push the scrotum up. P for pren, P for push. The cremaster reflex is a reflex where if you take a Q-tip or use your finger and you gently stroke the medial inner portion of the thigh, the testicle will move up and sort of retract into the scrotum. If you see that, that's a positive cremaster reflex. Now, depending on what happens with the pren sign and with the cremaster reflex, we can differentiate right off the bat using only these buzzwords if they're given to us, whether or not we're dealing with epididymitis or testicular torsion. So if these items, the pren sign and the cremaster reflex are positive, we're dealing with epididymitis. If these items are negative, we're dealing with testicular torsion. Now, just for completeness sake, I'm going to put some more stuff on the slide that you could look for in the question stem. But remember, the pren sign and the cremaster reflex are going to be how you figure out, is it epididymitis or testicular torsion? So all this other stuff is just extra crap. So for epididymitis, because it's mitis, right, it's inflammation of the epididymis, this is usually an infectious cause. So you're gonna look for other signs of, of suggestive infection. So you could see fever, you could see dysuria, you could see increased urinary frequency, you could see urethral discharge. What I wanna point out, and this second part is much more high yield for step two, level two, and beyond, not necessarily step one, but the most common cause of epididymitis overall is E. coli, and this distinction is really important. So if they ask you what's the most common, you know, they describe epididymitis to you, and then they ask you what's the most common cause, what's, what pathogen uh, is the most common cause, if they just say most common, the answer is E. coli. But what some questions will do is they'll describe someone for you who is young, less than 35 years of age, and you're supposed to infer from that that they're sexually active. And if the question, instead of saying what's the most common cause, and instead says what's the most likely cause, now you have to pick either chlamydia or gonorrhea. Because although the most common cause overall, regardless of age, is E. coli, the most likely cause in someone who's less than 35 years of age and sexually active is chlamydia and gonorrhea. This is a test favorite. So you have to look at the wording of the question on step two, level two, and step three, level three. If it's most common cause, period, answer is E. coli. If it's most likely cause and the person is less than 35 years of age, you wanna pick chlamydia or gonorrhea, all right? 
So again, this is just all extra crap, but I'm putting it here for completeness sake. Now let's look at the testicular torsion side. So if the Pren sign and the Cremaster reflex were both negative, we're dealing with testicular torsion. And the other things that you'd look for are nausea and vomiting and a high riding testicle. Don't even worry about what that means. It's just high riding. The other thing that you want to look for is a painless scrotal mass if this presentation is a torsion in neonates. And that's important because you're, you're probably not going to see something like a testicular tumor in a neonate. So a lot of people see scrotal mass and they freak out and they pick the tumor when in fact if this is the presentation in a neonate it can still be testicular torsion. So despite all of this extra information, the bottom line here is that the Pren sign and the Cremaster reflex is what you use to figure out what we're dealing with. Again, Pren sign, you push P for Pren, P for push, you push or lift the scrotum up. If that relieves the pain, that's a positive Pren sign. Cremaster reflex, you stroke the intermedial thigh, kind of just at the top of the thigh below the scrotum. And if the testicle retracts, that's a positive Cremaster reflex. Now the way to remember this because both the Pren sign and the Cremaster go together, is you really just need to memorize what's happening with the Pren sign. And therefore, in your head, you could be like, well, if the Pren sign's positive and I have a mnemonic that tells me positive Pren, I also know it's positive Cremaster for epididymitis. And then the opposite would be true for the negative signs. So how do I remember this? Well, if you lift somebody's scrotum up, and you improve the pain in their testicle, one might say that you have the Midas touch, and Midas for epididymitis. So the Midas touch, if you lift their scrotum up and the pain gets better, you have the Midas touch. And that reminds me that in epididymitis, when you have a positive Pren sign and therefore lift the scrotum up and pain improves, you have the Midas touch. So Pren, positive Pren in epididymitis. And then in my head, I just pair a positive Pren with a positive Cremaster. So if you have the Midas touch, you also have a positive Cremaster. The opposite is true for testicular torsion, and that makes it super simple to differentiate epididymitis from testicular torsion. So we're already done the highest yield part of this conversation. Differentiating torsion from epididymitis is very important to do. And again, really all you need to do in that question is look for the, the Pren sign and the Cremaster. And if they give that to you, you're going to get the answer right. So now that we have that down, let's talk about the difference between a hydrocele and a varicocele. And just like with torsion versus epididymitis, the reason that hydrocele versus varicocele, the reason that that's so difficult is because the presentation is going to sound the same. There's really just going to be one or two major buzzword differences that you need to pay attention to. So for hydrocele versus varicocele, the presentation is going to be a painless enlarged testicle. And the big question here, just like back with torsion versus epididymitis, we were asking ourselves about the Pren sign and the Cremaster reflex. The question here is, does it transilluminate or what happens with transillumination? And just briefly, as the name sort of implies, transillumination is you take a light and you put the light behind the scrotum and you shine the light through from the back to the front of the scrotum. And whether or not that that light goes all the way through the scrotum tells you whether you're dealing with something that's cystic or whether something that's solid. So if it's cystic, it the light will pass all the way through. But if it's solid, then the light will be blocked at some point and won't pass all the way through. So that is how you determine if there's positive transillumination and the light shines through and it's cystic, or if there's negative transillumination and the light is blocked and it's solid. So if it is positive transillumination, we're dealing with a hydrocele, and if it is negative transillumination, we're dealing with a varicocele. Now, some more information just for completeness sake. So again, in the question stem, you wanna focus on transillumination to figure out if the answer is hydrocele or varicocele. But some other details that you probably wanna know are things like causes and some other high yields that they might go after. So for a hydrocele, this is due to fluid accumulation in a sac around the testicle. And that sac is actually derived from the tunica vaginalis. The other thing that test writers sometimes go after is the difference between a communicating versus a non-communicating hydrocele. So the big difference is whether or not the hydrocele will change in size with the Valsalva maneuver. So in a communicating hydrocele, that type of hydrocele is due to the failed closure of something called the processus vaginalis. 
And as such, the Valsalva maneuver will cause the communicating hydro seal to increase in size. You don't really need to know more nitty gritty details than that. I would say for communicating, just know two things. One, failed closure of the processus vaginalis in case they ask you an anatomy question. And two, that it does increase in size with the Valsalva maneuver and therefore it's reducible. So that's all communicating. Now, non-communicating hydrocele's have t what we say no connection to the peritoneal cavity or the peritoneal space. So the fluid that accumulates in a hydrocele in a non-communicating hydrocele is derived from something called the tunica vaginalis. And basically what's happening here is there's either over secretion of the fluid or the body does a poor job of resorbing that fluid and therefore it's likely to form the hydrocele. Now the main difference between communicating and non-communicating besides the anatomy is that in the non-communicating hydrocele, the Valsalva maneuver doesn't change the size of the hydrocele and therefore the hydrocele is not reducible. So bottom line here, is when you're looking at a question and you think you're dealing with a hydrocele versus a varicocele, the big thing to ask yourself is what's happening with transillumination. But if the test writer wants to do a follow-up question or be really annoying, they could ask you about the difference in communicating versus non-communicating. Communicates is affected by Valsalva and therefore reducible. Non-communicating uh, is not affected by Valsalva and therefore not reducible. And that's kind of easy to remember because non-communicating has non in the name. So non-communicating is non-affected by Valsalva and non-reducible. And then communicating is just the opposite. Now some other stuff, just for completeness sake, for the varicocele, really the cause here, the affected anatomy is the pampiniform plexus. And this is due to obstruction of the, sper the spermatic vein, and that occurs proximally. The other thing that you want to know for tests is that it's usually the left testicle that most commonly has the varicocele. And the reason here is, remember, this is a very high yield anatomy point, is that the left spermatic vein, which drains the left testicle, inserts up at the left renal vein at a 90 degree angle, whereas the right side will actually go right into the IVC. So on that left side, because the left spermatic vein is inserting at a 90 degree angle, at the left renal vein, the drainage out of the left testicle is like a little bit more slower, you know, it's a little bit more obstructed. And therefore, it's more likely to have an increased hydrostatic pressure that gets sent back onto the left testicle. So if you see the varicocele, it should be left sided. That's a very high yield anatomy point, because if you're given some some type of right sided testicular pathology, you actually want to start looking for red flags that could actually be a testicular tumor since most of the pressure should be on the left side. So that's varicocele. And then the last thing that you want to look for in varicocele is the, the phrasing or the buzzword bag of worms. If you see that uh, and they're describing a physical exam, they're really hinting heavily that you're dealing with a varicocele. So again, bottom line, you're really only worried about transillumination, but for completeness sake, know these other high yield bits that get associated with both hydrocele and varicocele. So right now, here's what we've covered. We talked about the difference between torsion and epididymitis, and then we talked about the difference between hydrocele and varicocele. This is all the really high yield information. So if you feel comfortable with this and you wanna stop watching the video now, I'm good with that. I think that it's unlikely that you'll be given a testicular tumor on your exam, or at least it's it'll occur with less relative frequency than these other topics. But if you wanna just finish up for completeness sake, let's talk briefly, this will just be a couple seconds about a testicular tumor. So testicular tumors are different from the other aforementioned pathology because the onset tends to be a lot slower. Obviously for a tumor to develop this is going to happen over time, whereas with something like an infection and epididymitis or the testicle torsing around itself or hydrostatic pressure increasing to the point of like abrupt pain in hydrocele or varicocele, that's going to be much more acute. The testicular tumor tends to be a painless mass and usually on exams, it's going to be right sided. Again, it ties back to that really high yield anatomy point about the 90 degree angle on the left side and why usually you don't see that on the right side. So if the exam writer wants to tell you, bro, I'm giving you a tumor, they're gonna make it obvious and give you that red flag sign of it being on the right side. The other things you wanna look for on exams are two different buzzwords or, or two very high yield things. One, you could see lower limb swelling ipsilaterally and that's due to the testicular tumor causing local compression or obstruction of venous and lymphatic outflow. 
The other thing that a test writer would hopefully give you is that depending on which type of testicular cancer we're talking about, they'd give you a serum tumor marker to really push you in that direction. And the reason is kind of simple. They know that medical students taking step one and level one aren't really like clinically oriented yet. So differentiating the testicular tumor from the other testicular pathology we talked about is like pretty difficult. So they want to make it a non-controversial question and therefore they're very likely to give you that tumor marker either as being positive or negative in a lab printout. So look for that. Not a whole lot to say about testicular tumors, but I'm putting it here for completeness sake so that you can look at this info and compare it to what we've already talked about. So that wraps up this video. Uh, a lot of updated information, a lot of high yield information, but this is very important to know. These testicular pathologies show up a lot. They're very high yield, so know this information well.